Over the next few slides, we're gonna be looking at several scientists' experiments that led to ultimately the discovery of the structure and function of DNA. The first person we're gonna look at is Frederick Griffith, who in London in 1928 was working on um, a, an experiment involving two forms of pneumococcus bacteria. So pneumococcus is the um, bacteria which causes pneumonia. So when he was working with these two types of bacteria, what he was doing was injecting them into mice. And what he noticed is that of the two forms, there was an S form, which stood for smooth, and an R form, which stood for rough. But of the two forms, the S bacteria, he noticed, was virulent or deadly, and it resulted in the mouse dying. The R bacteria was non-virulent, um, and it didn't cause the mouse to die. Next, Griffith took the um, S form of the bacteria, the one that was previously virulent, and what he did is he heated up the bacteria. And so if you look at this information up here, we can see that DNA can actually withstand a temperature of up to 90 degrees Celsius without altering, whereas bacterial cells, um, anything above 60 will typically kill the bacteria depending on the type of bacteria. But there's this sweet spot between 60 degrees and 90 degrees where you can kill the bacteria bacteria, but the DNA inside will remain intact. And so what he did was he injected the heat-killed S bacteria into the mouse, and he noticed that now the mouse lived as opposed to before when the bacteria was live. So here's what Griffith actually did. If you look at these first two columns, or sorry, the middle two columns here, you'll see that the live R bacteria was non-virulent. It did not kill the mouse. And the heat-killed S bacteria was also non-virulent. It didn't kill the mouse. But when he combined the two in this last trial, he suddenly had a dead mouse. So here's what happened. In the heat-killed S bacteria, the bacteria itself was dead, so it could no longer kill the mouse, but the DNA inside the S bacteria Bacteria was still intact. So in this last combination, the DNA from the heat-killed S bacteria got transferred to the R bacteria, making the R bacteria deadly. So it was ultimately the R bacteria which killed the mouse. Griffith concluded that some material must have been transferred from that heat-killed S bacteria to the live R bacteria. And of course, now we know this is DNA, but at the time he didn't know what this was, and so he simply called it the transforming principle. The next scientist we're going to look at is a man named Oswald Avery, and him and his team of scientists were working in New York in 1944. So this was about 15 or so years after the work of Frederick Griffith, Griffith. but what um, Avery wanted to do was he wanted to identify that substance that had made the non-virulent bacteria become virulent. So he wanted to identify the transforming principle. So the first thing that Avery and his team did is that they isolated and purified the transforming principle from Griffith's experiment. And what they did is they ran a chemical analysis on several um, samples, and they found it um, all the percents of nitrogen and percents of phosphorus to be around what the known values for DNA was. Now, at that time, this was before um, DNA and especially its um, structure had really been discovered. And so at this time, the only thing that people really knew was that there was some kind of substance in the nucleus of cells, and they just simply called it nuclein. And so when we say like the known value for DNA, we're talking about that nuclein substance that they knew of, because really the name DNA wasn't even around yet at this time. So what Avery and his team concluded was that DNA was the transforming principle, aka the genetic material. Now, at this time, people were still skeptical because there was this debate going on whether the genetic material was DNA or protein, and Avery's results showed that it was um, DNA, but some people were still skeptical of this. So here's the last experiment in terms of the discovery of DNA that we're going to look at. And so this was done in 1952 um, in New York by two American biologists, Alfred Hershey and uh, Martha Chase. And so they were studying these viruses called bacteriophages. And a bacteriophage is a specific type of virus. It's one that can only infect bacterial cells. So it wouldn't be able to infect you and me since we're not bacteria. So here's a picture of a bacteriophage. And so um, what was nice about the virus is that it contained both elements that were being questioned about this genetic material. So it contained DNA and protein. So it had both elements that we were looking at. 
So here's a summary of Hershey and Chase's experiment. So they were trying to identify the genetic material. And so in order to do this with these bacteriophages, here they are right here, they used radioactive elements to label either the DNA or the protein in the viruses. And so in this first um, row right here, you can see that the outside of the bacteriophage is kind of glowing, and that's supposed to represent um, it emitting off radioactivity. So what this um, Her Hershey and Chase used for this is they used radioactive of sulfur because that was an element that was present in protein but not in the DNA. So whenever the so what they did is they allowed the viruses to make more viruses on their own, but in the presence of this radioactive sulfur, they actually took that up into their structure. So what that means is that in this one right here, they tagged the protein of the virus with radioactive sulfur. And you can see here in this next one that as the um, bacteriophage infects the bacterial cell, that's what this represents right here, at the end of the experiment, there's no radioactivity in the cell. All of it left right here with the outer protein coat of the virus. So that first part really tells us that no, protein was not the um, genetic material. And then this second trial down here actually told us for sure that yes, it was the DNA. So in this case, they actually tagged the DNA with radioactive um, phosphorus. And so what happened is that by the end of the trial, when the um, viruses infected the bacterial cell, they noticed that the radioactivity was now inside the cell. And that told us that it was the DNA that got injected into the cell. Therefore, DNA was the genetic material. So Hershey and Chase's final conclusion in their experiment that is that it is DNA, not protein, that is the genetic material. The next scientist we're going to look at is a man named Erwin Shargaff. And so in 1949, he was working in New York as a biochemist, and he was studying the amounts of the nitrogen bases present in DNA. So we know already that the nitrogen bases in DNA are A's, T's, G's, and C's. And so what he noticed is that the amount of um, adenine always equals the amount of thymine in a um, sample of DNA, and the amount of guanine always represents the amount of cytosine. And so what he concluded is that there must be, for every A, there's a T, and for every G, there's a C. And in doing so, he was able to conclude that um, adenine always pairs with thymine and guanine always pairs with cytosine. So these are what we call complementary base pairing rules. So here's where the story starts to get a little juicy. And so we get to Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. And they were working in the early 1950s in the race for the DNA structure. They were trying to figure out the um, overall structure of DNA. And they were using this technique called X-ray crystallography. And what happens in X-ray crystallography is that a molecule is crystallized, and then you shoot an X-ray through it. And what it does is create a pattern for you to determine its structure. So Rosalind Franklin was really good at this, and so she was actually invited to King's College in London um, to work with uh, Maurice Wilkins in his lab. So at the time that she moved into the lab, um, Maurice Wilkins was actually gone on vacation, and he knew that he was getting a new lab mate, um, and he knew it was a woman, and he f uh, figured that since it was a woman, he was getting like a lab assistant, um, but what he didn't know is that she was actually going to be his peer, so she moved in and starts doing her research, and he comes back from vacation, and he's a little shocked to see that this woman is working in his lab and kind of encroaching on his territory, so because of this, there was already some friction between these two individuals. So this photo here, this is called Photo 51, and it's Rosalind Franklin's famous um, photo of um, DNA. And so what she did, she crystallized the DNA and bombarded it with x-rays, and all the atoms in the DNA caused the x-rays to diffract, and that pattern is captured on film. So when she looked at this picture, she was able to determine that it was the nitrogen bases in the middle of the DNA molecule with the um, sugar phosphates on the outside. So in the same era, we have James Watson and Francis Crick, and they're working also um, in England trying to construct a model of DNA. Now, their way of going about this is a little less scientific than Rosalind Franklin's method. What they were doing was constructing these models um, out of 
uh, metal and wood, and that's what they're showing right here. Now, a problem that they had is that originally they placed the nitrogen bases on the outside of the molecule, and we know now that they're actually located on the inside. And so actually there was um, a time when Rosalind Franklin was at a conference with these two gentlemen, and um, she actually pointed out to them that they had it backwards. And so that was kind of embarrassing to be called out by a woman, especially in this time period. So James Watson actually wrote a book later called The Double Helix, and in the book he actually talks about how this woman, Rosie is what he called her, and how she would be so much prettier if she actually wore makeup and you know did her hair and that sort of thing, which is pretty derogatory considering that she was this brilliant woman working you know in a scientific field. So anyway, this was just kind of to show what, what was going on um, sort of behind the scenes of all of this and exactly what it meant to be a woman scientist in the 1950s. So ultimately what happened is that Watson and Crick, as they were building these models, kind of just through trial and error, they were actually given the, that photo 51, the one that showed the nitrogen bases in the middle, they were given that photo by um, Maurice Wilkins. He actually gave it over to Watson and Crick, and they were able to correct their model and ultimately um, published a paper in the journal called Nature about the structure of the DNA molecule. So... Um, then what happened, Watson, Crick, and Wilkins, they were all awarded the Nobel Prize in 1962. Unfortunately, you can't be awarded a Nobel Prize after, um, after a person's died, and um, Rosalind Franklin ended up developing cancer, probably from working with the radiation of the, the x-rays, and so she actually died before she was given the opportunity to receive the Nobel Prize. So really kind of a, a bummer story here. Um, just some more kind of interesting information, though, is that, um, so of the two men, Francis Crick has since died. Um, I think he died maybe in the 90s. And um, James Watson is still alive, and I believe he's maybe 89 now. Um, and so James Watson, though, he's made several comments throughout his kind of older adult life that have kind of gotten him into trouble. And um, one comment in particular, basically people stopped um, giving him funding that he needed for scientific research that he was continuing to do. So he is actually the only person um, in history to have sold his Nobel Prize, the medal he got for the Nobel Prize, for money. And so he sold it for about $4.1 million so that he could have the money to continue funding research. But you can actually look up on Wikipedia if you look at James Watson. There's a whole section titled Controversies, and it talks about the different comments that he's made that really have either offended people or even angered people. And so a lot of people are refusing to fund his research now. Another interesting thing that I like to point out is that this was in 1953, and 1953 really is not that long ago, and I always bring up to my classes that my dad was born in 1953, and he's 64 now, so literally in his lifetime, you know, the structure of DNA was first discovered, and, you know, we figured out that it was DNA and not protein was the genetic material, and all these things that were um, starting to come up back then, just think about how far we've really come now with science and technology. It's really pretty amazing. So before we can look at the DNA structure, we need to look at the structure of a nucleotide, which we've already looked at this year. A nucleotide has three parts. It has a phosphate group, a sugar, which in the case of DNA is deoxyribose, and then a nitrogen-containing base, which is going to be adenine, thymine, guanine, or cytosine. So the nitrogen bases, those are the only difference between the four nucleotides. So depending on whether that nitrogen base is a T or a C, that's the only thing that's going to actually make um, the DNA nucleotides different from each other. So earlier we talked about Shargaff and how he analyzed DNA from several organisms, and he found that it was the same four bases in um, all of the DNA in the organisms he looked at. And for a while he thought maybe they're always present in the same ratios, but then as he thought about it more, he realized actually each organism needs to have its own DNA because that's what determines its own unique traits. So earlier we talked that Watson and Crick, with the help of Franklin and Wilkins, discovered that the structure of DNA is a double helix. The DNA backbone is composed of repeating pentose sugars and phosphate groups, and because of that, we refer to it as the sugar phosphate backbone. So this is the sugar phosphate backbone right here. The DNA backbone is held together with covalent bonds. In fact, every single line that you see here that's a solid line is a covalent bond. So this bond, this bond, this bond, this bond, these are all covalent bonds. <laughs> 
When we're talking specifically about a bond between a sugar and a phosphate, so this one, this one, this one, this one, those all have a special name. They are called a phosphodiester bond, and it's a covalent bond, but when it occurs between a sugar and a phosphate, we call it a phosphodiester bond. The bonds that are between the strands of DNA are hydrogen bonds, and these are the same weak interactions that we saw back when we looked at the properties of water. So these bonds are not true bonds, they're just simply an interaction, and they're relatively weak, which is actually good. It allows the DNA to be able to separate from itself, to pull the two strands apart, and then have them come back together, kind of as if both strands were like a magnet. So what we call the base pairing rules, they show how the nucleotides always pair up in DNA. And so because um, A's and G's um, are what we call purines with a double ring and C's and T's are what we call pyrimidines with a single ring, that means that the helix overall has a uniform width um, to it. So and then finally, we... Um, say that DNA is anti-parallel, and that just means that it's parallel, the two strands are parallel, but they run in opposite directions, or they have opposite alignments. And so whichever direction the sugars are pointing to, that is what we refer to as the five prime end, which makes the other end three prime. And over here, you can see that um, it's just flipped. The three prime end is up top, and the five prime end is down below. The name for this actually comes from the location of the carbons in the sugars, which we don't need to know specifically, but that's just where those names are coming from.